Realm presents Remade, Season 1, Episode 5. Daylight filtered weakly through the leaves of the old forest. Overhead, a slate gray sky promised colder weather to come. Morning dew ringed with frost, collected in the wide fronds nearest the ground, tempting a young buck to pause and drink, putting its head down despite the tense silence, despite the expectation in the air. It looked up, and for the briefest of moments, two pairs of eyes met through the leaves. The buck was almost transfixed by the gaze lock of hunter and prey, frozen in the moment when both know that the chase is finished. The hunter lifted the spear over her head. Still, the buck didn't move. But then there was a loud snap, and from the thick trees stumbled the hunter's youngest, her second son. In his hands was a club, a small fallen branch he'd been proudly carrying around for days, hardly heavy enough to smash a field rat. At the sudden noise, the buck turned to bolt. The hunter threw her spear, but had to check her aim because of the boy's careless charge. Powerful back haunches sent the buck leaping into the trees. A moment there, and then gone. Her spear landed uselessly in the dirt. From behind her came a cry of frustration, a guttural howl that matched the feeling in her own breast. So close. The buck had been so close. Exhaustion brought her to her knees, or maybe it was the cavernous emptiness in her belly the hunger. Her first son, Luck, stomped out of the brush behind her and growled at his little brother. Luck smacked his own head and tore at his hair in anger, while little Mock cowered beneath him in shame. Another day without eating. What would they do now? A wail brought her back from inside herself, and she looked up to see Luck twisting his little brother's ear in anger. The two boys fell to the ground, wrestling, but Luck was bigger and soon had the advantage. Mock cried out again. With a growl of her own, the hunter rushed forward and cuffed her oldest son on the head. He should know better than to fight with his brother. Luck was skinny, too skinny for one his age, but he was still much stronger than his fragile sibling. He could hurt him, and then they would not be able to keep up with the others. A mother and her weak sons were barely tolerated as it was, and the tribe would not slow for the walking wounded. Luck let his brother go and turned his anger on his mother. There was rage in his eyes, but hurt too. And hunger. Pain. He smelled sick. He smelled weak, like prey. They all did. She wondered for a moment if he would strike her too. She knew how hot his blood was, his shame that she did the hunting, even though he was the oldest male in the family. It was an indignity in the eyes of the rest of the tribe. Females hunted in times of need, but never in place of their weaker sons. It shamed him. But Umta hunted because she was better at it than he was, and they were too desperate to worry about shame. Luck had beat his brother for scaring off the buck, but he was just as reckless, more so. She wondered if her oldest boy would strike her, but he did not. He never had. He simply slumped down under the dirt, eyes downcast, and rubbed his distended belly. Little Mock, sniffling and wiping at his tears, ran to her and wrapped his arms around her legs. Umta, he sobbed. Umta. Umta patted his round head and cooed into his ear until he quieted. Even as the forest came alive again, the birds called to one another. The danger was over. There were no predators here after all. Just more prey. A bright white sun peeked over the trees. The morning sky above this young forest was clear blue and cloudless, marred by occasional flashes of fire. Umta knew that the fire was really iridium flares of passing satellites. The sky was cluttered with them. In clear days like this, she could even make out the blue-white silhouettes of dozens of distant space stations, which glowed bright at night, but were only partially visible in the sunlight. Like the ghosts of the nighttime sky. Umta now knew the words for all those things. She had the tools to describe them, but describing a thing was different from understanding it. She'd spent a lifetime fearing and worshipping the sky, and even now she didn't like to look up, because she was afraid of what might be looking back down. Foolish. Funny that in this world it had turned out, her foolish superstitions were right. 
so she stayed low to the ground, beneath the trees, and treaded noiselessly through the new forest. The earth was old, but these trees were young, younger than she was. Regrown, perhaps, after some earlier catastrophe. Umta didn't even recognize most of the plants. She wore no clothing to catch on thorns, and kept her feet bare to detect every dry twig or crackling leaf before it snapped beneath her weight. Instinct and experience served her now, as she crept along the stream she'd been watching for an entire day. The fresh hoofprints in the mud told her that all she'd need was patience. That morning, she was finally rewarded. An animal appeared at the water's edge, just barely visible through the leaves. Head down, snout touching the water, and its deadly, blade-like antlers pointed to the ground. Jingwei called the beast a razor moose. Smaller than a normal moose, but more dangerous. Dangerous, like this young forest. The razor moose's head popped up at the sound of Umta's spear hurtling through the air. But this time, there was nothing to get in the way of her throw. The spear caught the moose in the neck, just above the shoulder blade. It stumbled a few steps before its front legs gave way. Umta didn't waste any time. She picked up a rock in both hands and, standing well clear of the thrashing animal, hurled the stone at the creature's skull. It was over. She'd successfully stalked and killed her prey. Alone. Umta! A child's voice whimpered in her head. Umta! Umta sank to her knees next to the kill and wrapped her hands over her head. She pulled her hair until clumps came loose in her fingers, until the pain drowned out the voices. Finally, when her brain quieted again, she slung the razor moose carcass over her shoulders and began the long trek back to camp. The beast was manageable, but still heavy enough that she had to stop and rest more often than she wanted to. She'd been out on her hunt for days already and didn't know how well the others had done without her. They were terrible foragers and even worse hunters. So she fought against her own tired muscles and the voices that threatened to grow noisy again and pressed on. At last, she spotted the twisting plumes of campfire smoke curling over the tops of trees. She'd made good time after all, and it was not yet noon. Umta paused while she was still in tree cover and searched until she found the rusted out shell of an ancient vehicle overgrown with ivy. Inside, she found the red jumpsuit she'd carefully folded and stashed away. Umta didn't like the feel of the synthetic fibers against her skin, but couldn't walk around naked in front of the others. They had strange ideas about privacy, and clothed themselves even in the hottest weather. The boy Hiram liked to talk about his god and a place called the Garden of Eden. In his stories, the first man and the first woman learned shame only after they'd sinned against God, after they'd stolen the fruit of knowledge from a tree. The caretakers had shared the fruit of knowledge with Umta, but there was no guilt in knowing who and what she was. She didn't feel ashamed of her naked body. Still, she knew she made the others uncomfortable as it was, and walking around naked wouldn't help things. So she zipped up the jumpsuit past her small breasts, hiding them beneath plastic threading, safely from view. She risked a look up at the sun high above. There was her old god, burning bright in the sky. How many mornings had she cheered her god's arrival? How many nights spent praying for his return? Praying to nothing but a burning mass of hydrogen and helium gases. 146 million kilometers from the Earth. Umta supposed she should have felt stupid for all those mornings and nights. If she refused to be ashamed of her nakedness, then she should at least be ashamed for the ignorant beast she had been before the caretakers did their work. Fuck that, she said out loud, choosing one of Seiya's favorite phrases. Umta had people to feed. She hauled the moose carcass back onto her shoulders, careful this time not to get blood on her clothing and started picking her way through the trees toward the camp. But she hadn't gone far when something stopped her. A feeling, a prickling at the back of her neck that said something was wrong. Nostrils opened wide, she sniffed the air. Hard to get a scent on anything other than burning wood smoke from camp. She listened and heard... nothing. No birds. The small creatures of the forest had gone quiet, like they didn't want to be noticed. But noticed by what? By Umta? Or something else? Slowly, she lowered the carcass. It had proven too hard to carry that and the spear, so she left her only weapon back at the kill spot, half a day's march away. Stupid. 
Alert now, she crouched low, keeping her eyes on the trees around her, while her hands searched the ground for a rock, anything that she could fight with. Her fingers curled around a stick, hardly as long as her forearm. A poor club, not even heavy enough to crush a field rat with. No, she pushed the memory away. She needed to be here, now, because something was in the trees just up ahead. Something trying to be quiet, but failing. Who goes there? Someone called. Identify yourself. Who goes there? Umta let out a sigh and stood up. She knew exactly who it was. Loki, it is me, she said, as she picked up the moose carcass for what she hoped was the last time. After a few more noisy steps, Loki emerged from the trees. He was tucking something inside of his jumpsuit. Umta only caught a glimpse of it, but it gleamed like metal. You know you shouldn't sneak around the camp like that, he said. I thought you were another one of those tigers, and I could have... Umta waited for Loki to finish his sentence, but instead he zipped up his jumpsuit, concealing whatever it was underneath. You just shouldn't try to be so quiet. I was not trying, said Umta. She turned and picked up the trail again toward camp. Loki ran to catch up with her. Wow, he said, eyeing the dead razor moose. Did you bring that thing down all by yourself? Umta grunted in the affirmative. Loki nodded, looking impressed. They walked together for a few moments before he added, You know, while you were gone, we killed that saber-toothed tiger. We caught it in a pit trap Jingwei and I designed. Umta glanced at Loki. You are sure it was the one that hurt Cole? Yeah, damn thing almost got Gabe. He bumped his head pretty good, but he'll be fine. She grunted again. Can he move? Yeah, he's awake and everything. Good. Coal can be carried. We should be leaving this place. Yeah, about that, said Loki. I was out scouting the eastern perimeter, and I found an old train station a couple of miles at most. The tracks run north and south, and get this. The rails are humming, vibrating. I think the power is still on like it was back on the station. Power? Electricity? That could be big. Jingwei thinks it is anyway. Everyone's talking about it. Umta stared at Loki. The boy looked uncomfortable, like he always did around her. It might be worth sticking around for a while, maybe, he said. If the train tracks have power, who knows what we might find if we keep searching those city ruins. She did not share his opinion. There had been power on the space station, that was true. But there had also been caretakers. The machines that had done so much for, and to, Umta. That had brought them all here to wherever they were. That had murdered Thomas. One of them had taken the poor boy apart in front of her eyes. She knew that the others didn't agree. But Umta felt that the farther they were from technology of any kind, the better off they'd be. These children were soft and scared, but they'd learn. There was another way to live. They'd stayed in one place for too long. Umta thought Loki had agreed with her on that, at least. So did Holden and a few of the others. Things, it seemed, had changed. Loki kept talking as they headed into camp together, but Umta wasn't listening to him. She was listening for birds that weren't there. Once they were inside the camp, Umta handed the carcass off to Loki who looked at it dubiously for a few moments, before muttering something about getting someone else to clean it. Loki claimed to be too busy with patrolling the perimeter, as he kept calling it, though as far as Umta could tell, no one had asked him to do so. Still, having someone keep an eye on their surroundings wasn't such a bad idea. The trees and the ruins. Those skeletal towers in the distance loomed over everything. What had once been a great city was now just a relic, waiting to be claimed by the forest that had grown up around it. There weren't many of the mighty towers left standing, skyscrapers of a lost age, and the ones that remained ended in broken points. The ruins frightened Umta, and it wasn't just the skyline, which resembled jagged teeth. There had been those who'd argued for taking shelter in the ruins, but there was a practical reason for avoiding them. Though those hollowed-out buildings offered the safest shelter in the forest, 
anything that offered shelter in the wild would be claimed by the strongest first. Umta had no doubt that the saber-tooth that had hunted them had its den somewhere in those ruins. And who knew what else might live there? That was why it was so disturbing to see what had happened to the camp in the few days that Umta had been gone. What was once a temporary array of hammocks and a few flimsy lean-tos made of sticks had been replaced by half-constructed shacks, walled in with planks of some kind of plastic metal alloy. Sheets of the stuff were stacked in piles, along with other man-made items. A few folding plastic chairs, some metal oddities that looked like machinery. The others had been scavenging while Umpta was gone, but not for just food. They'd been searching the city. Umpta wandered among the others, their smooth, hairless faces turning to stare as she passed. Several of the girls were standing around the boy, Wesley. He was one of the youngest, and his cheeks were still round with milk fat. This was a boy who'd never known a single hungry day until now. Wesley had gathered a small pile of whitish mushrooms with golden caps, but the others were looking down at them skeptically. May was shaking her head. You can't be serious, she was saying. You want to kill us all. No, said Wesley. They're chanterelles, not poisonous at all. Hiram helped me pick them. His scout leader was the vice president of the local mycological association. See? He popped one into his mouth. Tastes like apricots. May just stared at him. What? Wesley asked, his mouth full. I'm waiting for you to drop dead, said Amelia. I'm not touching them. But I spent all morning picking them. Umta walked over to the group, and they immediately grew quiet. Most of them looked away. Amelia never looked directly at Umta, or at least not when Umta was looking back. But Umta knew that when she turned around, the red-haired girl would stare. Only May looked her in the eyes. She was that brave, at least. But the look she gave Umta was loaded with the unspoken question on everyone's minds. Where did you come from? Umta waited for the question whenever she spotted the others staring, saw them trying to figure her out. It had to come one day. Hi, Umta, said May instead. You're back. The question went unasked and unanswered. Umta grunted. Then she bent down, picked up a mushroom, sniffed it, and put it in her mouth. Wesley was right. It tasted fruity. Good, she said, and started to walk away. She could hear them whispering behind her back, even before she'd gotten more than a few feet. She ate it. You see how she sniffed it? I bet she can smell poison, like a dog. Dogs can't. As Umta drifted out of earshot, she glanced over her shoulder. The girls were now eating the mushrooms with obvious relish. Even May nibbled on one of the golden caps. Wesley beamed up at them. Of course, Umta couldn't smell poison. That was ridiculous. But Hiram had proved he knew how to forage. And if he told Wesley the mushrooms were edible, then that was enough for Umta. Besides, someone should trust in Wesley. The boy needed it. The day progressed, and the sun journeyed across the sky. No, the sun wasn't moving. Umta was. They all were. It was hard to keep separate what she knew and what she had believed for all her life. Umta now knew so much that sometimes her brain hurt. When she came across Saya, the girl was arranging her things beneath a basic lean-to shelter made of fir tree branches. Her things being little more than the backpack she'd escaped the station with and a water bottle. Holden was crouched nearby, rubbing sticks together to try to light a campfire. It wasn't surprising. If Saya was there, then it figured that Holden would be close. The two had a special bond amongst the group, being the only two who'd known each other before waking up in the station. But it was obvious to anyone who cared to look that Holden's feelings went beyond their shared history, whatever that was. Saya's heart was better hidden, her feelings more opaque. She was at times protective of Holden, needful at others. But there were also times when she could be cruel. Umta watched them closely. The others had had their share of arguments, some genuine and some petty. But when Saya and Holden argued, it was dangerous. Holden was furiously rubbing two sticks together, trying to catch a spark. Come on, goddammit, he said. Fucking flame on already. Saya laughed, but it wasn't mean-spirited. 
You don't have to do that, she said. I got my own fire going last night, you know. All by myself. She made a muscle. Girl Scout training. Yeah, well, I lasted two weeks in the Cub Scouts, said Holden, tossing the sticks aside and sitting back. All we did was make fish out of paper plates. So, you know, if anyone in camp needs help with arts and crafts, I'm their guy. I can do it, Holden. Yeah, but I need to learn how. I need to get this right. All right, let me show you. Saya started to gather up the fallen sticks when she noticed Umta watching them. Holden, she said, smiling. Look who it is. Umta. The boy stood up and dusted his hands off on his filthy pants. A polite gesture, Umta guessed, but pointless. We were starting to worry. Game is getting scarce, said Umta, practicing her shrug. Yeah, well, now that we've taken care of that tiger, there'll be more for... It's time to go. What? asked Holden. Go where? We need to move on, said Umta. Move the camp. Find fresh game. I told you, Holden. Saya picked up the sticks that Holden had tossed aside and started to rub them together, twisting a stick vigorously between the palms of her hands. To Umta, she continued. Jingwei doesn't think we should leave yet and Holden's scared of her. Jesus, I'm not, said Holden, scratching at the patchy hair on his chin. Cole already had a thick beard coming in, but Holden's was fine and sparse, like a baby's hair. She just got some good points to make is all. While you were gone, Loki found this old train station, and it looks like the tracks still have power. Everyone's talking about it. Jingwei says that's a sign that there might be power still in the city ruins. She has people searching for generators, anything like that. They should stay out of the city. Wesley's already found all this plastic sheeting. They're calling it plasty steel because, I don't know, sci-fi or something. But the stuff's really light but sturdy. Look around you. Jingwei's got everyone building a real village. No. It's been 12 days since we came down the beanstalk. Too long. I'm putting together a team to follow Loki's train tracks. Maybe if we find something there, we can convince. Umta let out a bark as she stamped her feet. Then seeing the reactions on Holden and Seiya's faces, she calmed herself and slowly shook her head. Another gesture she'd picked up. A less threatening way of disagreeing, she supposed. Holden, you saw what the caretakers can do. You and Seiya saw what they did to Thomas. Holden looked away. Yeah, I saw. Do you think the caretakers on the station were the only ones? Jingwei and the others are willing to bet yes, said Holden. I asked what you think. I don't know. He glanced at Seiya, then up at the ruined city framed by sunlight. Honestly, I've been wondering. Yes? If anything were after us, and I'm not saying anything is, but if so, they'd probably expect us to make for the closest signs of civilization. We're kind of doing just what they'd expect. Umta pointed to the ruins. There, a few hours' hike from the elevator we all came down in. In his defense, Holden did say all this already, said Seiya, although he could have said it louder. I told Jingwei and the others what I think that I agree with you two. But everyone's scared and tired of sleeping in trees. They're talking about making this camp more permanent, and eventually, once we've had a chance to explore, maybe even moving into the ruins. If we can find someplace better along the train tracks, people might be willing to move, but not anytime soon. Everyone voted, and it looks like we're staying put, said Holden. At least until coal is better. Umta stomped her feet. She pulled her hair. She didn't care if she was scaring the children. You are all wrong. We are a tribe now, and a tribe doesn't need to vote. It needs a leader. Holden threw up his hands, exasperated. Then go to Jingwei. Umta shook her head. I came to you. I'm sorry, said Holden, but we were outvoted. That's just the way we do things where we... 
I mean, where we come from. There, the unspoken question again. Where do you come from, Umta? Like the others, Holden wouldn't ask it. Not that it mattered, because Umta was sure he'd guessed the truth anyway. She left the two of them without another word. But she couldn't quiet the low rumble in her throat, a guttural whine of frustration. Whatever the caretakers had done to her brain, they'd given her intellect, they'd given her this language. But it still wasn't enough to talk to these people. On the opposite side of the camp, she found Jingwei putting the last touches on a new structure. The foundation was basically reinforced with piles of scavenged concrete, but the walls were plasty steel sheets laid against a wooden frame. Even the roof was made of the strange material, overlapping like shingles. Of all of them, Jingwei was the one person whom Umta really admired. Thanks to the caretakers, Umta understood the engineering concepts behind what Jingwei did, but there was still a part of her, a part of the Umta that was, that watched her work in awed wonder. Loki fancied himself a warrior, but Umta had known real warriors, and they'd never impressed her. But Jingwei was a maker. Hands like hers had built this world, had built the ruins that loomed over them all. Umta found herself a little starstruck in front of the girl. Jingwei and Alex were currently struggling to haul a wide sheet of the plasti steel onto the roof, and failing. Jingwei was perched atop the roof, while the young boy was trying, and failing, to shoulder the heavy piece of sheeting. Wordlessly, Umta got underneath and helped him lift it. Oh, Umta! Jingwei smiled and accepted Umta's help. Thanks. Alex didn't say anything. Together, Umta and Alex helped Jingwei put the final sheet of plasti steel in place, finishing the shingled roof. It was a simple structure and looked like little more than a shack, but Umta was impressed by how sturdy it was. That didn't change how she felt about it, however. They couldn't afford permanent homes. Not here. The job done. Alex wiped his hands on his pants and admired their work. We're badass. Damn right, said Jingwei. Why don't you go get cleaned up for dinner? I'll finish up here. Alex gave them both a little wave and trotted off toward his tent. After what happened to Cole and Gabe, I figured our first priority should be a med station, Jingwei explained as they watched the boy go. It should stay dry in there, and there's room enough that we could move Cole in today. Last night's rainstorm was rough on him. Nevea has been collecting strips of cloth off people's jumpsuits to boil for clean bandages, and I'm thinking we could store those in there. You know, make like a real hospital tent. Or shack, I guess. Did you and Alex build this by yourselves? Jingwei sucked at a splinter in her finger. Hmm? No, of course not. Everyone pitched in. Wesley was supposed to help us with the roof, but he's a no-show. So thanks for the assist. Umta laid a hand on the doorframe, admiring the clean right angles. There were hardly any gaps in the walls at all. Jingwei was right. The wind and the weather would have a hard time getting in. But you designed this. Yeah, said Jingwei, smiling. You know, back, well, back before... I was going to study advanced engineering. You know, composite polymers and that kind of thing. But I have to admit, it's ridiculously fun to build a log cabin. Or plastic cabin, I guess. But this is built to stay? Asked Umta. She knew the answer, of course. Jingwei's smile melted. Look, I know we'd all talked about moving on. And Holden and Seiya already gave me an earful. It is not safe here, said Umta. It's not safe out there, either. Jingwei gestured to the half-completed shacks. At least here, we might be able to scrounge what we need to survive. Who knows what else we'll find in those ruins? She gave the wall a light kick. And solid walls will do a better job at keeping out those saber-tooths anyway. We should be worried about more than just saber-tooths. Jingwei sighed. I know what you three saw up there in the station, and what happened to Thomas is terrible. But have you considered that maybe that one caretaker was just, like, psycho? I mean, why would the others go to all the trouble just to kill us? Again. What Jingwei probably wanted to say was, kill us all again. But that was a hard thing to say out loud. 
to admit the truth that she'd been dead once already. I am afraid of those ruins, said Umta. I do not like this place. Listen, Jingwei. Be quiet for a moment and listen. Jingwei cocked her head in confusion, but she did as Umta asked. After about 30 seconds, she asked, Um, what am I listening for? Birds. But I don't hear any birds, just people. Umta grunted, then remembered herself and nodded her head. Still, Jingwei looked confused. Why didn't these people understand the obvious? There are no birds, Umta tried to explain. And there should be birds. Well, I know I've seen some around here somewhere. But not today. The birds are quiet today because something else is out there. A predator. You mean another of those tigers? I do not know. Well, maybe we're the ones scaring the birds away, said Jingwei. Isn't that a possibility? Umta had to admit that it was. People obviously hadn't walked this forest in a very long time, so there was no telling what their sudden appearance might do to the wildlife. Possible, said Umta, but I do not think so. Why? It feels wrong. Jingwei winced as she tried to work the splinter out of her finger with her thumbnail. She didn't seem to be listening, not really. Umta resisted the urge to grab her by the hair and drag her out of here. She would have, if there weren't so many of them. We must leave, Umta repeated. Can we talk about it more tomorrow? We must go now. You can't be serious. Jingwei actually laughed. Today, it'll be dark in a few hours. That is why we have to go, Jingwei cut her off. Tomorrow, let's all talk about it tomorrow. Tonight, we'll build up the campfires real high. Wild animals are scared of fire, right? I'm just, I'm exhausted, and I bet you are too. Why couldn't any of them feel it? These children, their minds were sharp, but their instincts were so dulled that they didn't even understand what they were. The razor moose Umta had killed earlier that day at least knew that it was prey. And because of that, it had stopped only for as long as it had to. Long enough to get a drink of water. And that had been long enough to get it killed. They were all just animals with their heads down. It was time to move. Past time. But if Holden and Seiya couldn't make the others understand, then how could Umta? Yes, tomorrow, said Umta. Jingwei squeezed her arm, and Umta flinched. No one here touched her, ever. I promise, Umta, tomorrow we'll talk it out. Now, I gotta go find Wesley and chew his ear off. The kid keeps disappearing into the woods. But I'll see you later, okay? Umta remembered to nod this time, and she watched as Jingwei went off in search of Wesley. Or maybe that was just an excuse to get out of the conversation. Tomorrow wouldn't change her mind, or the minds of any of the others. Tonight, they would sleep in their new shelters, warm and dry. And come morning there would be no chance of convincing them to leave. Come morning. Umta stared up at the ruined city skyline in the distance. The shadows there grew ever darker, as the sun dipped lower on the horizon. It was time to build up the campfires and start cooking the evening's meal. At least Umta could offer them food. The others could sleep tonight with full bellies because their Umta had provided. But Umta wouldn't sleep despite the exhaustion of days spent hunting. She would stay awake and watch over them until morning. That her young ones had been able to sleep at all was a blessing. The hollow hunger in their bellies often woke them in the night. Little Mok had cried out in his sleep for his umta, but she'd been too weak and exhausted herself to do much to comfort him. She pulled him close and fell back into her own troubled dreams. In the morning, she awoke to the torturous smell of meat cooking nearby. The tribe's Chaka, the firekeeper, had stirred the coals of last night's blaze and added fresh twigs and grass until it burned high again, and roasted what was left of the previous day's hunt. Awful, 
sour tasting and smelling of piss. Yet it stirred such hunger inside her that the cramps were almost unbearable. Mock cracked his teeth against the bones of last night's meal. One of the other umtas, a kindly blue-eyed one whose mate was young and strong, and always got his choice of the hunting party's kill, usually set aside a few greasy scraps for umta's boys. When he'd been just a little smaller, and her dugs still full of milk, she'd sometimes let Mock suckle alongside her own young one. But these days, her milk was long dry, and the herds were moving south, so all she had to offer were a few marrow bones. Umta prostrated herself before the rising sun, the giver of warmth and light. She pressed her face into the dirt to show him her submission, to thank him for the kindness displayed by some of the younger Umtas in her tribe. Had it been up to the elder Kabas, the fathers, one lone Umta without a mate, and with young mouths to feed, would have been banished. They lived, day to day, by the generosity of the other females. Generosity that would not last if they did not catch the herds. Soon, there would not even be marrow bones to spare. The tribe was getting ready to move. Chaka had proclaimed that these lands were cursed, and that the herds were headed south to escape the poison of foul grass and dirty water. The tracks of lone aurochs had been spotted in the area, but they had proved elusive, and the tribe was competing more and more with other predators for dwindling prey. So, as they had done in the past, the tribe would leave to follow the main herd. Umta wandered among the tribesmen, searching for her first son, Luck. He would have to help her carry Mok if the boy tired on the day's march south. They could not afford to fall so far behind that they lost sight of the tribe. As she passed, she lowered her eyes in deference to the Kabas and ignored the angry barks of the gray-haired Umtas and childless females who did not trust her. She was alone and young and fertile enough to still be a threat in their eyes. She was not here to steal their mates. Umta was only looking for her son. She searched for luck, but did not see him. Usually, if the boy wasn't with her, he was watching the hunters, who in turn ignored the scrawny, fatherless boy. Umta knew luck dreamed of hunting with them, but without a father to stand for him, he would never be allowed. That morning, the hunters weren't outfitting themselves for the hunt. They were preparing instead for the long march south. Hunting parties traveled light, but today they carried all their belongings on their backs. Umta stepped around them, careful not to get in anyone's way or draw attention to herself. She dared to look at their faces when she could get away with it, searching for luck. The boy was nowhere to be found. She began to feel agitated. Where had he gone? Soon she would be forced to call his name, and the others would hear her. See her? They would be forced to acknowledge her presence. One of the hunters, a hairy, bear-like male known as Kag, who'd once been friendly with Umta's mate, caught her eye and grunted at her. Instinctively, Umta looked away. Kag had his own mate, and lonely as Umta was, it wouldn't do to attract his attention now. That could only cause more trouble. But he drew close and stood over her, so close that she could smell the stink of morning on his breath. He didn't grab for her. He didn't even move. After a long moment, she dared to look up at him. They locked eyes, and then he lifted his spear and gestured with it. That direction, beyond the campfires. That was where luck had gone, out into the wide grasslands beyond. Umta's foolish, desperate son, her oldest, had set off in the early hours of the morning to hunt by himself. He'd gone off to prove himself a grown male. But the tribe was leaving. No one would wait for him. No one but Umta cared. Umta could not stop, not even to rest. Luck was not a skilled hunter, and he left tracks that were easy to follow in the tall grass. But they went in the entirely wrong direction, opposite the tribe's march south. If she did not find him soon, they would never make up the distance. Little Mock clung to her back and whimpered, getting heavier with every step she took. It was strange how so bony a boy could weigh so much. But exhaustion and hunger were close to draining what small reserves of strength she had left. She looked to the heavens and begged for strength, until the sun god burned spots into her eyes. He granted her the strength to carry on, and after a long time running, she spotted buzzards wheeling in eager circles overhead. Her stomach, already cramped with hunger, 
clenched even tighter with panic. Her bowels threatened to loose themselves, but she was too empty. Umta was a hollow thing, driven by the one instinct she had left in life. Protect the children. Slowly, she lowered Mok to the ground and gestured for him to stay put. Then she crept forward toward the spot on the prairie where the birds circled. As she got closer, she heard a low grumbling and smacking of lips. Something was beasting up ahead. Carefully, fearfully, she peered through the tall grass and saw something hunched over the carcass of a slain auroch. The shape had nearly its whole head shoved into the auroch's torn stomach. It was gorging itself. Look, Umta said, and her first son pulled his head up, his hair slick with blood and his chin dripping with bits of flesh. Her stomach growled in spite of her. At first, Luck reached for his nearby spear, but when Umta stood up, he broke into a huge grin. Her son began beating his chest and let out a cry. The hunter, proud, victorious. Meat for the family, meat for the tribe. Umta stepped closer. The auroch was enormous, the kind of beast that a whole hunting party would have needed to bring down together. And yet here, her son had managed the kill all by himself. She felt a glow of pride at his accomplishment, tinged with the shame of having kept him from the hunt for all these years. The grass rustled next to her, and little Mock poked his head out. When he saw his older brother and what he'd done, he let out a bark and ran forward. Luck barked back at him, reminding the younger sibling that this was his kill. But he didn't stop the little one from feeding. There was plenty for all three, and more. They were too hungry to wait for a fire, and the fresh blood smelled of brine and iron, making Umta heady with the scent. She fell to her knees. Let her sons have their fill, then she would eat, and... There, on the auroch's left flank, was a gash that ran the length of its stomach, not a wound easily made with a spear. With a slowly spreading dread, Umta pushed her way past her feeding sons to examine the beast's neck. Luck was standing nearby, watching her. The auroch's throat had been torn open, the jugular ripped clean. These were not spear wounds at all. These were bite marks. Umta looked up at her first son, and he returned her stare defiantly. He grunted and smacked his chest. His meaning was clear. My kill. Mine. He was lying. The auroch had been brought down by something else and Luck had stumbled onto it, perhaps. He'd probably followed the buzzards as well. Umta laid a hand on the beast's side. Its blood was still warm. And it hadn't been devoured. This was no mostly eaten carcass. This was a fresh kill. Which meant that whatever had done it would be nearby. Close even now. Luck, her stupid boy. Her weak, stupid, starving boy. Umta grabbed Mok and tried to pull him off the meat, but he clung to it. He hadn't eaten in so many days. How could he let go now? What was that sound? Umta heard something, like a slither against leaves. Luck heard it too and lifted his spear. When Umta steadied herself, she caught a glimpse of eyes watching her. Several pairs of small, black eyes. She leaned closer and saw the vague outlines of small, furry faces, nearly invisible against the grass. Cubs. They'd come for their meal. Which meant they'd been led here by their mother. Umta shoved Luck aside as a roar tore through the prairie. Spinning around, she saw the great she-wolf leaping from the grass, her eyes glinting with familiar rage. A lone mother and her cubs. It was her kill. Hers alone. Umta didn't hesitate. Even though she was weaponless and weak, her instinct drove her on, and she threw herself in the wolf's path. The beast didn't hesitate either. It pounced, knocking Umta to the ground, and before she could catch her breath, she felt fangs pierce her throat, trapping the scream inside her. Run, run, my children, run. But beneath the pounding of blood in her ears, she heard a cry of mingled rage and anguish. Then suddenly she was released, dropped to the ground. Her heart was beating too fast, pumping her blood out through the wound in her neck and onto the dirt. 
She rolled to the side and saw the wolf with its jaws around Buck's throat, his now broken spear lying useless at his side. He hadn't run. He tried to save his umta. Umta was dimly aware of little Mok's wailing, cut off with a brutal finality. Her boys were gone. Her weak, hungry children. She didn't want to see their faces, so she tried to look up. But her god above had gone dark, and the sky was swallowed in shadow. The world turned to blackness. It was fully dusk now, the sun little more than a pink halo over the ruined skyline, and Holden and Jing Wei were raising their voices at each other, loud enough for everyone to hear. Umta watched, but said nothing. Could at least start packing tonight, Holden was saying. We should have followed the plan and left today, but at least we can make an early start tomorrow. Whose plan? said Jing Wei. Yours? I don't remember anyone electing you president around here. I'm not. Look, at least we should think about heading for that train station Loki found. If we follow the tracks, we might find some place even better. Or we could end up tiger food, said Jing Wei. At least here we can fortify, protect ourselves. We talked about getting away from the orbital elevator as soon as possible. Talked about, never agreed. And that was before we found all this. Jing Wei gestured to the camp full of resources, tools. And anyway, we fixed the elevator good. No one's going up or coming down. How can you be sure? Well, we did a damn better job than shoving some chairs in the doorway. Umta hopped down from the tree she was perched in. She'd only been half listening to the argument anyway. She was glad that Holden had found courage enough to stand up to Jing Wei. Seiya probably helped with that, but it was too little, too late. They should have left when there was daylight. Instinct, or primitive superstition, but Umta still feared the dark. And this night in particular. Because the birds hadn't returned. No one noticed Umta wandering away. A crowd had gathered around Holden and Jing Wei to watch the argument. Umta could remember a time when such a disagreement would be settled by tooth and claw. The bloodied loser tossed out, banished. Umta couldn't help but grin at the thought. Lucky for Holden, they'd evolved since then. As she wandered the camp, Umta followed the smell of meat roasting, until she found Gabe and Loki turning the razor moose over a blazing fire pit. Gabe had a makeshift bandage wrapped around his head, but he was awake and hungry. Nevea and Sebastian sat nearby with Cole. They had fashioned a splint for his leg. It itches, he complained. That means it's healing, said Nevea as she tied the splint tight around his leg with fresh bandages. You don't really believe that, do you? Smiling, Nevea shook her head at her patient. Umta crouched down to examine Cole's leg. Nevea and he both started at her sudden appearance, but she ignored them. You are feeling better. Yep, said Cole. I told everyone it wasn't that bad. You weren't telling anyone anything said Nevea. You were out cold. Well, when I woke up, I told you. That is good, said Umta. You will be ready to leave. Nevea stopped fidgeting with Cole's splint just long enough to look up at Umta. He shouldn't be walking. Not safe here, was Umta's answer. Why couldn't they see it? So you think Holden's right? asked Sebastian. The boy was usually so quiet, a watcher who rarely confronted anyone, but tonight, fear was making him bold. Do you really think following those train tracks is the answer, even though who knows what we'll find out there? Everyone, please, said Cole. I'm hungry, and my leg hurts like hell. He glared at Nevea, and now it itches. Can we let the fighting rest? Umta turned and stomped off. Nevea called her name, but Umta didn't turn around, didn't answer. She was just getting angry, and when she got angry, she scared people. Better to be alone for a while. As the sun disappeared completely, people began to congregate for supper. As Umta rejoined them, she noted their nervous expressions. They should be celebrating tonight's feast, but worry had spread through the camp instead. The others could feel it now, too. 
Everyone except for Jingwei, it seemed. They could feel the unnatural quiet. The trees grew ugly in the dark, and the ruins ominous. This is what a herd looks like when it knows it's being stalked. All they could do now was build the fires high, and hope it would be enough to keep whatever was out there at bay. At least for one more night. Stars began to appear in the blue-black sky. The light of distant space stations twinkled. Somewhere up there, untethered, was the station where Umta, where they all, had been reborn. A metal womb floating in the darkness of space. Why? She shivered and stepped closer to the fire. Gabe cut into the moose with a sharpened stone knife. The meat was tender enough that they were able to pull it apart with their fingers. Someone tapped Umta on the shoulder. It was Jingwei. Have you seen Wesley? She asked. I still can't find him, and we're going to put it to another vote. Stay or go? We need everyone to weigh in. Jingwei was cut off by a scream in the night. High-pitched, the sound of metal grating on metal. A failing vocalizer centuries old. A benign piece of machinery never meant for such a cry of rage and madness. A caretaker. Her exhaustion forgotten, Umta ran for the nearest structure, Jingwei's new medical shack. She scrambled onto the roof and peered out at the darkness. But the firelight had spoiled her night vision. She was blind in the dark. Below her, the others were doing a poor job at not panicking. Holden and Jingwei were shouting orders to pick up the few spears they'd fashioned, as well as rocks, clubs, whatever was handy. The caretakers were metal, and Umta hadn't yet figured out a way to harm one. But this time they had numbers on their side at least. If it attacked the camp, perhaps they could swarm it, overwhelm it. Stay together, Umta barked. Stay close. But most weren't listening to her. A few held weapons and put their backs to the fire. Others ran to hide in their tents. Jingwei appeared at the base of the wall. Where's Wesley? She called. Her face was pale with worry, even in the dark. No one's seen him. Wesley, who'd gone into the ruins in search of supplies. A boy who just wanted to prove himself. Another metallic cry rang out, only this time it was closer. Very close now. If they could just band together. This time, however, the cry was answered. At first, just a single call, distant and echoing nearby, perhaps from the ruins. Then another, and another. Oh my god, Jingwei whispered. Umta turned her back on the girl and squinted up at the ruins. There, in the tallest towers, lights came on. Clusters of red lights, like glowing spider eyes, appeared in the broken windows. They began to move, out the windows and down the sides of the building. They answered the call, and they were coming. Another scream, only this time from a human voice. Umta leapt down from the roof. She rolled to her feet and kept running. Jingwei was close behind her. They reached the fire pit in time to see the caretaker emerge from the trees, revealing itself at last. Larger than any she'd seen before, the caretaker was twelve feet high on its spindly spider legs. Even though Umta knew that it was metal and circuits, its dull black carapace swallowed the firelight and made it look like a thing carved out of darkness. Eight red eyes glowed in its face. A god. A demon. A nightmare come to life. But worse than all that was the body it hugged to its chest. The caretaker cradled Wesley close like a bloody rag doll. The boy's head bent at an odd angle. Someone else screamed. It might have even been Jingwei. Whoever it was, the sound seemed to agitate the caretaker, and it answered with its own horrible cry. Like a child throwing a tantrum, it flung Wesley's corpse to the ground. This was wrong. Predators kill for food, never for sport. Jingwei was shouting into Umta's ear, telling her to run, but Umta could not. All she could do was stare at Wesley's body, the boy who had wanted to prove himself, the boy who'd hunted mushrooms. For a moment, Umta found herself back on the plains, 
She could feel the grass tickling her shins. She could hear a boy's voice calling out, calling for his umta. Rough hands shook her loose of the memory, and Umta turned to see Jingwei. We have to get everyone out of here, she was shouting. Help me! Then Jingwei was gone, and bodies surged around her, even as a new chorus of metallic cries erupted from the other side of the camp. More caretakers were arriving. Umta pushed her way through the panicked bodies. Run for the trees, she yelled, but she wasn't sure if anyone was listening. Then she remembered Cole, who could barely walk. Where was he? Fresh screams sounded in the distance, and Umta spotted spindly shapes moving through the camp. They were tearing apart the tents and anyone they found inside them. Umta kept running. Luckily, she wasn't the only person who was worried about the wounded. Up ahead, she spotted Seiya and Gabe, who was on his feet. Together with Sunita, the three were helping Cole to safety. He was moving, but Cole's face was white with pain as Gabe and Sunita supported him. Seiya kept watch with a spear as they headed for the trees. Then a caretaker appeared, maybe the one that had killed Wesley. Its body was slick with someone's blood, making it look even blacker in the moonlight. Umta ran through the grass, the sun hot overhead. Where were her children? The caretaker was upon them, Saya jabbed at it with her spear, but the thing batted it away, knocking her to the ground. Sunita and Gabe were forced to drop Cole, and he cried out in pain. Sunita was crying. Gabe grabbed for Saya's fallen spear, for all the good it would do him. The caretaker loomed over them, its forelimbs capped with snapping blades like shears. From somewhere nearby came a strange popping sound. The caretaker paused at the noise. Then the pop came again, and the caretaker staggered. A smoking hole had appeared in its abdomen. Another pop, and the caretaker's head exploded in a shower of metal and fluid. Loki emerged from the trees, holding a shiny object in his hands, the same one he'd been hiding in his jumpsuit. Loki had a gun. What the hell? said Gabe. It's a rivet gun, said Loki looking somewhat stunned. I think. Wow. Hey, Saya's still alive, said Sunita, feeling the girl's neck. I think she's just knocked out. Grab her, said Loki. Let's head to the train station. It's not far. Then let's go, man, said Gabe. Stop talking. Gabe hefted Saya over his shoulders in a fireman's carry, while Loki and Sunita helped Cole to his feet. Loki spotted Umta standing nearby. Umta, come on, we're headed for the train station. They didn't wait to see if she was following them, and Umta didn't bother to try. Instead, she drifted, numb, back into camp. She passed bodies, some whole, some in pieces. It looked like a few more had made it to the trees. Others were trying in vain to put up a fight. The camp was burning the fire spreading, and smoke stung her eyes. The caretaker stalked through the carnage, unafraid of the flames, killing indiscriminately. It was only a matter of time before one found Umta. Where were her children? Why couldn't she hear their voices anymore? What would they do without their Umta? Slowly, calmly, she climbed to the roof of the med shack once more so that she could get a better look at the camp. Maybe she would see them down there. Maybe they would wave to her. Saya, Saya. Umta squinted against the smoke and spotted Holden and Jingwei. Holden held a spear, and Jingwei was wielding the club she'd fashioned from the first dead razor moose. She yanked Holden by the arm, trying to get him to run, but he fought her. He continued calling out for Saya. The poor lovesick boy didn't know that she wasn't there. She got away. Umta thought to herself that someone should tell him. She decided she would as soon as she found her children. Mock. Luck. They would be so afraid without her. A shape appeared, another caretaker walking slowly, almost strolling through the carnage. Holden and Jingwei couldn't see it because of the smoke. They were headed right for it. The caretaker stopped, 
red eyes locking onto its prey. The sun was so bright, but the tall grass kept getting in the way. The she-wolf was getting ready to pounce. Jingwei and Holden emerged from the smoke. They froze as they spotted the caretaker looming over them. With a cry of her own, Umta leapt from the roof and landed on the caretaker's back. She was expecting the soft fur of the wolf's pelt. But no matter, her fingers found purchase in the ridges of cold metal instead. Umta bit down on the wolf's soft flesh and shattered her front teeth on the hard metal carapace. Run, my children, run. The caretaker swiveled its head around 180 degrees to face Umta, even as it reached a metal arm around to pluck her off. The claw dug into the meat of Umta's shoulder, but she didn't scream. She was too focused on the eyes. All she had to do was rip out the thing's eyes, and it wouldn't see her children anymore. Then Umta did scream as she yanked herself free of the caretaker's grip. A hunk of her flesh stayed behind, but she was free. Scrambling up the creature's back, she came face to face with the insect-like face watching her. With her good arm, she clawed at that face. Shards of glass cut her fingers as she plucked a red-faceted eye from its socket. The caretaker didn't make a sound. Two more arms reached around, their metal blades flashing. Umta was going to be torn apart. Then it stopped, just as someone called for her. Umta, get down. Her shoulder was bleeding down her side, and she didn't think she could hold on much longer if she wanted to. Holden was below her, holding a spear, which he'd somehow managed to jam into the unarmored spot around the caretaker's leg socket. He shouted as he threw his weight into it, driving the spear deeper. The caretaker spasmed and toppled over, but Umta managed to roll clear and not get crushed beneath it. The caretaker wasn't dead. Its front legs, the ones that were going to tear Umta apart, still worked. But it ignored her and instead turned them on Holden. Holden, who should have run. Her stupid boy. Her weak, stupid boy. Umta scrambled in the dirt with her one good arm. She couldn't feel the other one much anymore. She found a rock, or one of the hunks of cement Jingwei had used to reinforce the med shack's walls. Whatever it was, it was heavy. The caretaker tried to stab Holden, and Holden ducked out of the way. But he lost his footing and fell hard. He was prone now, and the caretaker wouldn't miss a second time. Jingwei came running to his aid. She was about to get herself killed too. Umta lifted the stone high and brought it down on the caretaker's head. The metal dented beneath the blow, just above the remaining eyes, and one shattered, its light flickering to dark. Umta smashed it again, and again. The hard skull opened, gushing out some kind of whitish fluid and exposing the sickly wet mess of circuitry beneath. Still, Umta didn't stop hitting it until the head collapsed and the caretaker stopped moving. Even then, she kept at it, giving up only when she was too exhausted to lift the stone. Her shoulder was in agony, her fingers bleeding, and her lungs burning from the smoke and smiled a bloody, toothless grin. You're Umta, she croaked. They were there to catch her as she stumbled. Holden wrapped her arm around his shoulders. Jingwei, get her out of here, said Holden. I'm going to find Seiya. Umta grunted. Then she remembered to shake her head. Seiya is safe. They are headed to the train station. You heard her, said Jingwei. Let's go. Together, the three of them ran. They spotted more survivors. Sebastian had a bloody cut along his forehead, and Alex was helping to guide him. Others appeared in the chaos. Jingwei told everyone they could find to regroup at the train station. Some made it to the trees. More did not. Finally, they made it to the denser part of the forest. Umta wondered why the caretakers hadn't followed them. They had been running across open ground and should have been easy targets. She risked a glance over her shoulder. The caretaker stood in a line at the edge of the camp, facing the trees where the few survivors had escaped. There were at least a dozen caretakers, their red eyes glowing in the dark. At their feet, 
were the shapes of their two fallen brethren. They'd gathered their dead. Umta and the others crouched in the trees for a moment, afraid of what the caretakers might do. But the machines did not follow. Maybe they can't see us, whispered Jingwei. But Umta knew differently. She'd watched as they'd moved unhindered by the blinding smoke. These were machines that hunted in the dark. Then what were they doing? Why were they standing like that, all in a line? Holden provided the answer, the realization dawning on him a second too late. It's a firing squad, he shouted and shoved Umta to the ground. White light flashed. An arc of heat shot forth from the caretakers, setting fire to the woods, charring bodies. Umta covered her head as the trees exploded above her, raining flaming bits of wood and burning leaves down upon them. Then the light ceased, and Holden pulled her back to standing. Run! She caught a glimpse, as they bolted blindly into the dark, of Jingwei lying on the ground. Half the girl's head had been burned off. Smoke rose in little curls from her corpse. Umta ran. Holden never left her behind, even as she stumbled and fell. He was always there to pick her up again, to push her to keep running. Eventually, exhaustion caught up with the both of them, and they huddled together in a shallow gully, overgrown with underbrush. They hoped it would be enough to hide them. There were no more flashes in the night, and nothing followed them. When dawn finally came, they crept out of their hiding place, raw and exposed in the light of a new day. East, Loki had said. That's where the rail station was. A few miles east. That's where the other survivors would be headed, if there were any. They would follow the sun. Remade is a Realm original production. You're listening to Remade Season 1 by Matthew Cody. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Remade is a Realm original production, created by Matthew Cody and written by Matthew Cody, Andrea Phillips, Carrie Harris, E.C. Myers, Kirsten White, and Gwenda Bond. Produced by Lydia Shama and executive produced by Julian Yap and Molly Barton. Starring Greg Tremblay and Laurel Schroeder. Audio directed, produced, and sound designed by Amanda Rose Smith. Additional editing by Corey Barton. Original theme composed by Amanda Rose Smith. Cover art by Liz Castle. Find more shows like Remade by following Realm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or at realm.fm. <laughs>